us stand together and worship. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Let's sing about it.
single promise that God has ever made will go unfulfilled. Amen? Amen? He's promised us so much and we can count on each and every one of them. Count on his promises one by one, the old gospel song said, and I'm so thankful for that. Are you glad to be in God's house this morning? Amen. Say amen. 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 Left side was a little bit louder than the right side. I'm not sure why, but uh, <laughs> it's good to see you in God's house today. Thank you for your faithfulness. If you're joining us online today, we're glad that you're here as well. Let us know you're here. Share the stream. And uh, for heaven's sake, worship with us where you are this morning. Don't just watch. Worship with us where you are. All right. Anybody got your memory verse memorized yet? We got a couple. All right. That's great. Just one verse this month. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Let's say it together. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Speaking of God of the promise, amen? That's a promise in God's word. We confess, he will forgive. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Amen. Well, if you are glad to be here today, find someone you hadn't said good morning to yet. Tell them you're glad to see him at Liberty Baptist this morning. Seeds continue in worship this morning.
gathered in this place under one name, one name. Sons and daughters full of faith under one name, one name, under one name, one name. Oh, let's declare this together. On this rock we stand in the power of Christ. The keys in hand we carry a fire. The gates of hell will cower in the fire. Your church is alive. Your church is Jesus, we're thankful as we sang to the God of the promise and we declared our thankfulness for the fact that you keep every promise you make. Scripture tells us straight from your mouth that upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And since that day, the gates of hell have been given it all it has to see the church fall. And although right now in my class we're studying the persecution of the church in the book of Acts, I know that it's a different type of persecution in 2021, but I feel like the church is under fire 
more now than it has been in decades. And so, Father, today we're thankful that while Satan, his demons, the gates of hell, and everything that's anti-Christ, everything that's anti-God is fighting to see the church fall, the church shall forever stand. I'm thankful for the church. I'm thankful for this church. Father, as we've made this song sort of our anthem this year, this is your church. And God, we know no matter what goes on outside these walls, that you have us in your hands. And God, I'm thankful for the opportunity to come together, to live in a country where we still have the privilege to meet together and have the freedom to worship together. God, we feel your presence in this place today, and we ask that you stay here with us. God, as we've softened our hearts, as we've drawn our focus to you through the music, now the most important part of the service is coming when your word is open. God, we don't want to walk out these doors the same that we came in. We want to leave different, more like Jesus. So we pray that today. God, have your will, have your way. We operate in full surrender today. We give you ourselves. Do what you will, Father. We love you and we thank you for your love for us. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray all these things. Amen. You may be seated. Stop. 
Well, amen. Good job, Miss Sammy and Brother Hill. And thank you, band, this morning to Brother Hill for a great job in worship. It's good to be in God's house. Amen. amen. Well, it's good to see you. I apologize for missing last week. Won't get into all that, but it's good to be back. And I sure appreciate Brother Copeland always standing in, or Brother Hill standing in and doing a fantastic job uh, in my absence. It's great to know uh, I can actually, when I'm sick, stay home rest, and I don't have to worry about what's going on here because I know the Word of God is being taught and everything's being done decently in order because we've got good godly men and women, for that matter, that are doing what they're supposed to do and they're in their places. Well, I invite you to take your Bibles this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, but before we get there, we're going to be in James chapter 4. James chapter 4 for just a quick second, and then we're going to get into 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Of course, so there's been a lot going on in our lives uh, as a family uh, and just in the world in general uh, in the last month or so. It just uh, has been unbelievable, and, uh, and yet God has been faithful through it all, and God's presence has been real. His peace has been uh, excellent, and, uh, and I tell you, it, it's good to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I tell you, folks, as I look around this world, and of course I read and study and listen uh, to, to podcasts and YouTube videos and stuff every single day, my day is occupied with that kind of stuff. And I tell you, uh, if you can't see how quickly this fast-moving train is until Jesus comes, uh, I, I don't know what to tell you because I believe that the Lord Jesus' return is imminent. I mean, if He came right now, I would not be the least bit surprised because everything in our world is getting ready, uh, ready for Antichrist. All the things that are going on around the world, not just in America, but the entire world. I mean, America, it's pretty crazy right now, but Australia and Europe and, and uh, the Far East, it's just absolutely mad what is going on. And you see it, if you know the Bible, you see that all these things are just pieces of the puzzle that are coming together. What's surprising to me is how quickly it's happening. I, I always thought, you know, it, it's, it's going to be a long period of time before these things unfold. Even though we talked about the return of Jesus being imminent, but folks, I tell you, in the last three years, we are on a crash course at supersonic speeds for the return of the Lord Jesus. Now, as Christians, listen, we're not looking for Antichrist, amen? amen. If we were looking for Antichrist, then we need to be uh, buying guns and ammo and stocking food, right? But we're not looking for that. It's not a bad thing to have guns and ammo and food, but we're not looking for that. We're looking for Jesus Christ to come any moment, and then all the guns and ammo and food can be left to those that are left behind. I'm not going to be one of them. I know the Lord Jesus Christ, and I've given my life to Him. And so I said all that to say this. As a pastor, my job is to prepare the people that God has entrusted into my care, prepare them for Jesus to come. It's that simple. That when Jesus comes, you be found faithful. When Jesus comes, that you be found working. Why? Because the night is coming when no man can work. And all that we have, listen, where we're going to be and all that we will have is determined with what we do in this life right now. What you do with the Lord Jesus Christ will determine where you're going to be. And what you do for the Lord Jesus Christ will determine what you have in eternity for all eternity. We considered this thought just briefly Wednesday night and in our series of all, uh, all different things to talk about. We were talking about joy, but the last point of that um, little mini-series within the series was how that we can have joy in grief, how that we can have joy in difficulty, how that we can have joy in sorrow. So with that in mind this morning, this message is hopefully Lord willing and to His glory and honor to help prepare you to be ready for when he comes. In James chapter 4, we find a verse, and in that verse is a question, and it's a question that cannot be answered collectively. We can't all come together and go, you know what, let's come together and, and let's have a focus group, and, and then we'll answer the question. No, this is a question that each of us must answer individually. So notice James chapter 4 and verse 13. 
And it says, Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. And listen to what James says. Whereas ye know not what shall be on tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanishes away. Notice the question in the middle of verse 14. What is your life? You'll never face a more challenging question than that right there. It doesn't say what is life because the truth of the matter is if it asks a question like that, I mean, we can give all of these philosophies and, and observations and, and, and objectiveness, but the truth is we can't really even answer that except to say that Jesus is life, right? But it didn't ask that. It doesn't say what is life. What it says is what is your life? And the question's very pointed. And it's very personal. And for someone this morning, it may be very painful. What is your life? I ask you this morning, what is your life? And you might say, you know what, my life is failure. I could ask you, what is life? And you might say, you know, my life is success, relatively successful, and, and it's good. I could say, what is your life? And you go, it's been a disappointment. James goes on to say that life is like a vapor. It appears for a little time, and then it vanishes away. It's like the steam that comes out of the kettle. When the, when the kettle begins to whistle, we've got one of those. I love it. But it'll drive you crazy if you let it go too long, right? Beep, and the steam, And you try to grab the steam, and before you can get it, it's gone. And James, in his epistle, says, that's your life and my life. What is your life? I used a poem, Only One Life, in my message at my dad's service, and, 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 and a lot of people think about that, and they, they think only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. But I love the refrain at the very end of that, where it goes like this, Only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ shall last. And when I am dying, how glad I shall be if the lamp of my life was burned out for thee. Amen. Amen. What is your life? With that in mind, I want you to look in, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 this morning. And, and now, if this book is about anything, it's about life. And I want you to notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we begin reading in verse number 9, where it says, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builteth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, Wood, hay, stubble. Notice he, kept, he keeps, puts them all together right there. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. What day? The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. He's talking about the day when we, each of us, by ourselves, alone, in, in the naked, nakedness of the moment, with no one there as our advocate, with no one there as our, our explainer, with no one there to pat our back, we stand alone and we answer to Jesus. What is your life? Every man's work shall be manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is, or to see what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built it thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Our Father in heaven, we come before you again. We're grateful for the day of worship. And Lord, I'm thankful for every single person that's here every family that's represented here. 
Every man, woman, boy, girl, child, Lord, we give you thanks. And we ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit would rest upon each of us and fill us so that it, he might illuminate us with the Word of God this morning. And we might leave here different than we came in. Lord, I, I pray this morning that, that you would bind the devil's hands. I'm praying, Father, this morning that the devil will have a bad day and that Jesus will be exalted and glorified. Fill my mind with your thoughts, my mouth with your words. Use me simply as an instrument of your grace and mercy to preach your word, and may all the glory go to you. Lord, when the invitation is given, if there's someone here under the sound of my voice that has never given their heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Maybe somebody listen online or at a later date, on YouTube, Lord, I pray if they've never given their heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ and in salvation, that they would do that today. I pray for Christians that we can with joy answer the question, what is your life? And the answer will ring back resoundingly, it's a life lived for Jesus. Faithfully and fully. God, have your will and your way in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said? Amen. So the application of this passage right here, of course, is dealing with Christians, the people in the church and the pastor in the church. And a local church is compared here to a building. And the pastor is the, the, the builder who's responsible for keeping the materials in the temple at their very best. And, and that's certainly the case. And we think of that in a material world. That's why... Uh, you know, we spend a lot of time and energy and money to keep our facility looking nice. I believe that we ought to give uh, God our very best. Our founding pastor used to say, and, and my mom believed this wholeheartedly, that cleanliness is next to godliness. Now, I don't find that necessarily in the Bible phrased that way, but it makes good sense, doesn't it? I love the verse that says uh, in our, our memory verse, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to do what? to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I'll connect the two. So in a, in a material uh, way, we want to do our best. We want to keep things looking nice and in good order. But we're talking in a spiritual sense this morning. And more important than this building, more important than anything that God has blessed us with, is you and I and where we stand this morning before God, spiritually speaking. What is your life? The Apostle Paul was a builder that God used and he laid the foundation and that foundation is none other than, than Jesus Christ, amen? And that's not only the foundation in the church and of the church, but it's the foundation of each of our lives. The day, the moment that we were saved, a foundation was laid and what should be happening ever since that moment is we're building a life on Jesus, amen? And that's what Paul talks about. Apollos came and built on that foundation. And many others have, have built yet again and again and again and again over the centuries of time on that foundation. So I understand this passage. And I understand what it means. I understand the application. I understand there's a personal message here that's applicable to you and I this morning as believers in Christ. And as I read this text this week, and before I go into school each morning to... Uh, to work. I, I spent time in God's Word and, and time in prayer and this passage came up and as I, as I read it this week, the Lord hit me right in, in between the eyes it seems like and He reminded me of the question in consideration of this passage, the question that's found in James chapter 4 and verse 14, what is your life? And that's essentially what, what Paul is doing here and what Paul is saying here in this text. We each will answer that question, what is your life? What did he live for? What did he build? What did he really care about? When it was all said and done, what was important to him or to her? One day our Lord will say to each of us, what is your life? Or maybe in, in that day, what was your life? With that in mind, I want you to consider three things with me this morning, and I want you to note, if you like to jot down notes, you can do that. I want you to note first your life's legacy. Let's look back in verse number 9. It says, we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. 
according to the grace of God which is given unto me, Paul says, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, talking to the people of Corinth, and another is built to thereon, talking about Apollos and others, but let every man take heed of how he builds thereon. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So what we find here are two lives that are given in contrast one to the other. And it's inferred at the, at, at the beginning and will later be examined. And I want you to notice, first of all, in, in point A, under, under that main heading of Roman number 1, the life of a wise man. The, the life of a wise man. And, and notice first his laboring in verse number 9. Paul writes, for we are laborers together with God. Amen. I'm so thankful that, that God didn't just send me on this journey and leave me alone to do it all myself because I would have failed day one and, and again on day two. But I had the great promise that we are more than conquerors through Christ that loved us and gave Himself for us. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I need to quit doing this and I need to quit doing that. And, and we think about the negative, the things we need to quit, but what about the things that we need to do? I heard a man say this week, you know, we oftentimes consider the consequences of making a decision... But very seldom do we ever consider the consequences of not making a decision. And for Christians, it's not a matter of just putting off some things that that are bad and and dishonor God, but it's a matter of putting on Jesus Christ. It's a matter of putting on the things that are contained in the Word of God that will bring about the blessings of God on our lives. Amen? Amen. John 15, 5 says, I'm the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Jesus kind of sells it right there. On your own, you can do what? Zero. A big fat donut with the ring knocked off of it. Zero. Nothing means nothing. And so for the Christian, if we endeavor to do anything good, anything positive, and anything lasting, eternal, it must be with Christ. Amen? Amen. Not apart from Christ. Paul said that we're laboring with the Lord. And and every day we live, we breathe, we move in what? Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? But consider not only the wise man's laboring, but his building. And let's look in verse 10. The latter part of it says, But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You know what I see in this world today? People wandering aimlessly. And I see the same thing for Christians, unfortunately. Rather than having their eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, they're wandering about. And and I've got this goofy illustration I've used ever since I was a a youth pastor many, many years ago about a pinball machine. Anybody, have ever, anybody ever played pinball? Well, that's the way a lot of people live their lives. They're the proverbial ball. They get, bam, launched into life, and then it's a series of this flipper to that flipper to that flipper to this bumper, and bam, 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 and before you know it, zoom, it's right down the middle. And I don't know about you, I was never a good pinball player. For me, sometimes I'd launch the ball, and it would go straight down the middle. And I'm like, what? What in the world? But people live their life that way, just bouncing. It's not a, it's not a, a, a godly response based on God's Word. It's just reaction. React to this, react to that, and, and, and all over the place. What is it that you're working for? What is it if if God put the period at the end of the sentence of your life today, what is it that that you're working for that would last? What do you spend your time doing? And listen, I'm not not going to stand up here this morning and say, you know, you ought to be grinding in the Word of God every moment of every hour and singing hymns all day long. I'm not saying that. I think there are good, uh, godly things with family and and exercise, and, and, and even leisure where you can relax and enjoy God's creation and give God the glory through it. The Bible says even the heavens declare the glory of God. So I'm not saying that there's not time for those things. But all in all, where do you spend your time? The reality is, is 
for most Christians today, if they, if they log an hour in time for God and church all lumped together, that's about it. And it's an hour on Sunday and, and, and help the, God help the pastor that goes past 12 o'clock, right? What do you spend your money doing? What's your, what are you investing your time, your energy, your money? Somebody called it the ATM. William James said this, the great use of life is to spend it on something that will outlast us. Anthony Campola took a survey of 95-year-olds Imagine that, and he asked them this, if you could live your life over, what would you do differently? And, and they said two things. We would reflect more on our life, and we would do more things that would last beyond our life. That's pretty powerful when you think about it. When you think about what you're doing every day of your life. What is it that's going to still last, and what is it that's going to exist Again, when God puts the period at the end of the sentence of your life. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 90 verse 12, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. I I, I don't know about you, but but I want to be considered by my, at least my family and my sons as as having been a wise man when my, my life's work is finished. Amen? I mean, I, I, I want my, my two sons to be able to look at their dad and they know me better than anybody. Besides my wife, they, they, they know me. They know what I say, what I do, how I live. And they know what I preach. And they know if I'm a big fat hypocrite. Because it's easy to say one thing here and then go out and live something contra- contrary to that. And unfortunately, a lot of people do. They put on their one hour a day and, their, and their, 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 we don't wear a lot of ties around here. Brother Al does and he does a good job. I'm not a big tie person mainly because I'm fat. I've got a bunch of ties, but I don't like to be choked while I'm preaching, okay? But a lot of people do. They put on their Sunday best and they log their one hour and they piously sing the song about the, the things of earth will grow strangely dim, and yet they're, they're neep deck, uh, de, uh, neck deep in their, in their bodies and their hearts and their minds to the world. And when we get over into heaven one day, the things of earth will look strangely grim because the things we put so much time and energy in, the curtains of reality and, and eternity will be pulled back and we will all realize, you know, we spent a lot of time on things that really didn't matter. The wise are laboring with the Lord. The wise are building on the Lord. So there's a contrast, I said here. There's the wise man. And, and, and then notice, secondly, not only the life of the wise man, but the, the life of the worldly man. And let's consider for a moment his laboring. How do the worldly folks live their lives? Well, they do it with the flesh. It's sensual. It's not by the Spirit of God. It's not, it's not as this morning I prayed, God in heaven, I, I pray, Lord, that there'd be nothing in my life that would inhibit your word from going forth from my mouth. If there's any sin, unconfessed or unknown, Lord, I give it to you. I repent of it. And I ask you to forgive me of it. And I pray, God, today that you will use me by filling me with the power of your Holy Spirit to speak through me. And when it's all said and done, may Rick Ross be forgotten and Jesus Christ exalted. But that's not what the world's doing. They're living not by the Spirit, it's by their senses. The lesson we taught this week are, and I've used these words, abstract and concrete, and and of course you as as adults and most kids, you you get that, but when it applies to nouns, uh, you teachers are going to know what I'm talking about. Uh, And and, and a, a concrete noun, a person, place, or thing is a noun, right? We all know that. Person, place, or thing. A concrete noun is is something that you can touch, see, hear, or smell. An abstract noun is something that you can't touch. Uh, Like love, for instance, is a noun. 
And while you can see perhaps some of the results of love, you can't see love. Passion is a noun. But it's abstract. There's abstract and, and, and there's concrete. And, and, and the reason I bring that up is it's natural to use the five senses that we've been given. Although I'm becoming deaf as a post and blind as a bat. So it's, it's not looking good on those senses here lately. But the world, the unwise builder, that's all he has. Where the Christian, the wise man, lives his life being directed by the Holy Spirit. Lord, order my steps. The Word of God. The Spirit of God. The man of God. That's how God speaks today. And God speak through those things. Your Word, your Spirit, your pastor, and challenge my life so that I can follow you and be blessed by you. That's not what the worldly man and woman are doing. How do I feel today? Oh boy, that's a big one. How do I feel? I don't feel so good. And I get it. The reason why I wasn't here last Sunday morning as I was up all Saturday night with extreme chest pains, taking nitroglycerin, trying to stave off taking one more because if you take the third, you got to go to the ER, and I don't want to do that. I'll tell you, I didn't feel good. I was waiting until the as long as I could to, to talk to Brother Hill and Brother Copeland because I really wanted to be here. I hate missing. It ruins my whole week when I miss God's house on Sundays. But it wasn't God's will, and Brother Copeland did a great job, Brother Hill did a great job, and to God be the glory, amen? Some, I get it. Sometimes we don't feel, but folks, we can take that in an unhealthy direction. Why is it that so many people don't feel like being at church on Sunday morning, but boy, when work comes around Monday morning, they might not feel it, but boy, they're going to be there. You know why? Because your boss will fire your butt if you don't show up. But somewhere in our minds, we thought, well, Jesus is okay with me not coming just because I don't feel quite right today. And I'm not saying, listen, if you're sick, stay home. If you've got a fever, stay home. But if your big toe's hurting, rub some Vaseline on it or something and wrap it up and come to church, for God's sake. Amen? Why, people, how do I feel? Or they're, or they're not walking by faith, they're walking by sight. Things aren't looking so good. The worldly man and the, and the worldly woman, they're laboring. It's done in the flesh. Their senses, it's sensual. How they feel. And really, at the end of it, it's really what the flesh desires. What does the flesh want to do? Well, my flesh wants to sit on the sofa and with some nacho cheese dip and watch uh, the football game. Or my flesh wants to do something that would be an absolutely insane. It'll get you locked up. It involves weaponry or something like that. You get the point. That's why Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. This flesh has to be crucified. We can't live and be guided by the flesh. Our laboring must be done with Christ and for Christ and by Christ. James in chapter 3, verse 12 through 18 says, Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? either a vine, figs, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation, that's his living, his walking and his talking, his works with meekness and wisdom. But if you have bitter envies, and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but what? It is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. 
So many, so many people today say they're, they're Christians. And yet, folks, by very definition, Christian means to be like Christ. I'm following Christ. What would Jesus do? Look in the book. It shows us. They're going their own way and they're doing their own thing. They're living by their senses. They live their, their lives apart from Christ. If I ask you this morning, how many of you here today are atheists? Well, nobody would raise their hand. You're in church. And of course, atheist means to believe there's no God or agnostics, just another form of atheist. There's some supreme being, but we can't know him. He doesn't da-da-da-da-da. And nobody would say that. And yet, how many people live their lives, they're in church today, but they'll get up tomorrow and never engage their mind, their heart on the thought of God or the Lord Jesus Christ, not one little bit. And what is that? That's practical atheism. It's living your life as if there is no God, even though on Sundays you profess that there is a God. They raise their children apart from Christ. I mean... Yes, we go to church and I want to raise my kid in church and Sunday morning and, and Wednesday night we're going to be there, but the rest of the week it's, it's anything goes. And they let their kids fill their hearts and minds with, with every bit of garbage that's on the TV and on YouTube and on the video and they think they're being parents because they're in the same house, but that's not parenting. Parenting is not passively sitting by while your kids are over there playing with dynamite. Parenting is actively pursuing a goal with your children for God. My house, we lived there. I mean, my parents were strict. And some of it was, was probably a little crazy, and some of, most, the majority of it wasn't. I mean, I was a good boy, but my sister was bad, man. She got a whipping when she was like 15 or 16 years old. I think she's back in the nursery, so don't tell her I said that. But, uh, you know, our parents didn't fool around. You know what my dad told me? They, they, they tell you, and this is high school. This until the time, wasn't when I was 18, when I moved, until I moved out of the house. Uh, they want you to work on Sunday or Wednesday, you tell them you quit. You know why my dad thought that, why my dad believed that, and why my dad enforced that? Because I wasn't a provider. I wasn't, I wasn't a, a, a husband or a father. It had been different if I was having to provide for my family, but I wasn't. I was just a teenager wanting to play sports and chase girls and build cars. And you know what? My dad knew. That's not going to happen at the expense of God and you knowing what's right. And I got to tell you, I've been to seminary. I got nine years of college. But I tell you, I'm, I learned more from being right here at Liberty Baptist Church than I ever did in any of those institutions. You know why? Because that's the best place you can be and that's the best place you can raise your child. But at the end of the day, it's not my job to raise your kid. It's your job. Deuteronomy 6 doesn't say take them to the pastor and let the pastor teach them when they're laying down and when they get up and when they're walking in the way and when they're sitting at the dinner table. It says let the parents. Folks, without God, there's no life. Outside of Christ, there's no life. Everything was made by the Lord Jesus Christ and for the Lord Jesus Christ and even the next breath that we have comes from Him, I believe. So we must fully depend on Him. And again, without Him, we have nothing, we can do nothing, and we can be nothing. But with Him, all things are possible. Amen? With Him, all things are possible. So we see the worldly. They're laboring in the flesh. But notice, secondly, His building. It's for the flesh. Have you thought about that? So when God looks at your life, what does He see? Are you, are you wise? Or are you worldly? Well, I go to church and I listen to Caleb. It's not what I ask. Is your laboring with the Lord or with the flesh? Is your building for the Lord or for the flesh? Matthew 6, 24 says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, and that means basically money. Romans 12, 2, you know the verse. We've, we've learned it. First, 
uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And here it is, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of my, your mind so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God's okay with whatever, whenever, however? No. He says that you may prove what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect will of God. It, listen, the word acceptable means that it can be unacceptable. The word perfect means it can be unperfect, or imperfect rather. The word good means that it can be bad. So there's a, there's a contrast here. And, and, and you and I have to answer the question, what is your life? Is it good or bad to God? Is it acceptable or unacceptable to God? It, it, is, is it perfect? That, that means complete in Christ, or is it, or is it imperfect? Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. He talked about two things there that can spoil or ruin you. Traditions of men, that's religiosity. That's just going through the motions of, of serving God without actually engaging your heart and mind with God. It's checking a box, punching a time clock, whatever metaphor you want to use to describe what Sunday or Wednesday night is if you leave God out. You say, can you come to church and leave God out? Oh, people all over the country or in the world really are doing it right now at this very hour. One pastor said, if, if the Holy Spirit were removed from our church, we could print our little bulletin, our spiritual menu, and nothing would be different and we wouldn't even know it. Hey. Folks, that's sobering. If God didn't show up, would we even know it? I'm not for sure what it's like when God doesn't show up, but I can tell you what it's like when He does show up, amen. I was having a blast up there, man. I was ready to do an Eddie Van Halen down in front of you guys on the guitar, and I don't even know how to do it, you know. I was just having a good time worshiping God and playing the guitar and singing with God's people. The Bible says that God in, inhabits the praise of His people, and that ought to bring joy. And it can be fun, Right? I mean, we, I guess we could be those guys that sing, Holy, holy, holy. I'm so happy. <laughs> oh, this is awesome. You might want to notify your face, dude. Because you look like you, well, never mind. James, James had such a wonderful way of putting things. And in James 4 and verse 4, he says, and he's talking to Christians here. This is what makes this so powerful. He says, you adulterers and adulteresses, and by the way, he's not talking about sexual sin there. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. What? Yeah, we're in the world, but we're not out of the world. The Bible says, come out from among them and be separate. We talked about this Wednesday night, about that word holy. And what it means, you know what it means? It means to be cut, cut out. And it's, it's, it's really a, 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 a ranching term. And you understand if a, a rancher goes, Brother Tubbs has cows. And, and, and if Brother Tubbs said, I got to go cut a few cows out for butcher, what does it mean? He's going to separate some and take them to the butcher so that he can have the meat processed. And the Bible says that we have been cut out by Jesus from the world. We're cut out for a purpose. In Matthew 5, 4, says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Be ye holy, for I am holy. You go, boy, I, I, I'm going to have trouble with those. With Christ in your life and the Holy Spirit of God guiding you, you won't. We have trouble with those when the flesh rules the day. 1 John 2, 15 and 16 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 
Let me insert it again. What is your life? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of the life, it's not of the Father, but is of the world. So here it is. Are you wise or are you worldly? Is your laboring with the Lord or, or, or with the flesh? Is your building of your life with the Lord or is it, is it with the flesh? Folks, the answer to those questions reveals our life's ultimate legacy. And we'll answer the question, what was your life? And the answer is your legacy. It's what about we are. and what we're about, and what we'll be remembered for when we're gone. What is your life? Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Father in heaven, I'm not for sure why you wanted me to end in this moment and this time. There's still more in the message that you've laid on my heart. And I guess, Father, we can finish that next week. But for whatever reason, this is the time that we're to come to this moment and each of us to answer the question again today, what is, what is, what is our life? What's it about? Who's it for? Are we, are we moving and, and, and living and breathing in the power of the Holy Spirit or is it in the flesh? Are we wandering aimlessly in this world by the senses of what we see and, and what we hear and what we feel and, and the things that we can touch? And, and faith is just really a word, but it's, it, it, it has no practical application in our lives, Father. God in heaven, you know I'm nobody's judge and and Lord, this message spoke to my heart. One of the things I, I've considered a lot in the last three to four weeks is, is life and death. And next week, Father, we'll look at our death's declaration and what that's going to say. And Lord, I, I, th I think recently of, of the passing of my dad and the great legacy he had, but and then this week, uh, another funeral, Miss Jessie Pons and her legacy. And there's so many people going out into eternity, so many people. A neighbor of ours connected to a man this week that, that died in a head-on collision, and he was drunk. God, help him. I can't imagine the hurt and the pain to end a life with that legacy. You died and you took another person's life because you loved alcohol. God, how stupid. And yet, Father, if we're not careful, that could be somebody in our midst this morning. So God, we come to you and we ask you, Father, to help each of us to answer that question, what is your life? Not a husband and a wife together, not a, not a mom and a dad and kids, but each of us alone by ourselves before Almighty God. What is our life? What are we doing? What's important? If we stood before you this afternoon, God, what could we say? And more importantly, God, what would you say? Have your will in your way this morning. Speak to hearts, dear God, and, and save the lost. And for the Christian, each of us, God, help us to see this world is winding down to disaster. And Jesus, you're coming soon. I get goosebumps, Father, even thinking about it, that in this moment, even uttering those words out of my mouth, that it could be right now. And everything we've spent so much time and energy, every bit of it will only matter if it turns out that it was gold, silver, and precious stones of eternal value to you. 
And God, we'll talk more about that next week. But until then, Father, as Christians, God, put us on the path through the narrow gate, the straight gate. Order the steps of our life. May your word truly be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. For we know the devil's a beast. He's, he's ugly, he's mean, and he wants to destroy each of us. He's not trying to ruin our day. He's trying to destroy our lives. And if he could destroy our legacy as Christians, he will sure do it in a New York minute. God rebuke him in the name of Jesus Christ. Make your presence evident in our lives, not only in this moment, in this hour, but when we leave here. Help us to sense and, and see the continued work of your spirit through your word in our hearts and minds. God, have your will in your way right now as these pray and as others perhaps need to come and pray. Have your will. Christ be exalted. In Jesus' name. Ted's about our eyes closed as Brother Hill sings this morning. My prayer is that you would just simply yield your heart and your mind to God. You know what it is. You know what that thing is right now in your life, in your heart. Don't leave it. Don't leave here with it. Give it to God right now. And let Him have His way. For your kind attention, be seated for just a moment. Let me share with you a few announcements. Uh, 
if I may, uh, first of all, remember uh, to continue to pray for those that are are going through difficulty times. We've got some that have uh, uh, had surgery. Linda Ramirez had surgery last week. She's at home uh, healing up uh, good. My wife got by there to see her. My wife talked to Judy Schultz. Continue to pray for Ms. Schultz. Don't forget Ms. Schultz just because she's moved to Arlington. Uh, talk about a legacy. This church is, is her legacy in a way, and uh, especially many of the kids that grew up here that are adults now. And so remember her. Uh, you have her number, maybe send her a, a, a phone call, take a few minutes. And, uh, and also remember this week, it's on Wednesday, Ms. Slagle, that your surgery is happening? All right. And they're doing a, a, a right hip replacement. I tried to see if she'd get a two-for-one deal, but they weren't taking that offer. So uh, anyway, y'all pray for Ms. Uh, Slagle. They've got a, have you started your class yet? You're, you're, did, oh, yeah. Okay. Joint class. You probably need some more clarification when you call it that. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, no, we were teasing her about that Wednesday. She's, it's, a, it's a big deal. And so uh, let's pray that the surgery goes exactly the way the doctors and, her, and, and Ms. Slagle would like her to. It'll be successful, and she'll be back on her feet really, really soon. Uh, we miss you when you're not able to be here, and we're here for you. And, of course, we'll be uh, bringing meals, as we have been, uh, to uh, Ms. Winton and her family to Ms. Slagle, whoever uh, needs our help, we will be doing that. There's a couple of things. Remember, every Tuesday, the auditorium is open at 11 o'clock uh, with Ms. V. Tubbs. Uh, that's prayer time. You can come in here. And uh, in the bulletin, I see that they put uh, October. Boy, this year's flown by. It's a pastor appreciation month, so there's some bags on the table back there. If you would like to write some notes, bring cards uh, for either myself, Brother Copeland, or Brother Hill, we, of course, love and appreciate you. And uh, the best thing you can do for us is just be in your place, loving God and praising God. And uh, that's, that's the best gift that we can all have. But hearing from you, I keep every single note, every single card, uh, every funeral I've ever done, every, every message I've ever preached, I've got every one of them, every single one of them. I've, I've painstakingly made efforts to keep that. That way uh, uh, I have access to that. And it's, they're great encouragement. Sometimes when you're, you're not feeling so great, you can go back and pull those cards or notes out and, uh, and just read them again, and what a blessing it is. And so remember those things, and we appreciate you uh, and all that you do. October 17th, we've got a refresh. We've had to move some things around because of sickness and funerals and things of that nature. And uh, so that, that will be October the 17th. It's, ref, it's uh, Brahms on Caulfield at 6 o'clock. Everybody's invited, the whole church. Uh, just show up. We'll pack that place out and eat all their ice cream up. And uh, then remember the kids' Halloween party, Wednesday night, October the 27th, and it's at 7 o'clock. You can wear your costume, uh, the kids, and um, don't do anything too scary. It don't bother me, but it might bother some of the little kids and some of the old ladies in the church, so be careful about that. No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. But uh, anyway, wear your costumes. Candy donations are needed, so uh, you can see Miss Kim Ross and, uh, or my wife or Miss Copeland uh, if you have questions about that, or Miss Tubbs as well. Also remember the Faith Refuge Mission Meal will be October 29th. That's uh, before Halloween that Friday night at 5.30. Uh, see Miss Sarah Smith. Miss Smith, raise your hand. Miss Smith right there. And uh, there's a sign-up sheet on the back table, and it's the Women's and Children's Shelter is what it is. And they go out there, and they, they have a time of singing, devotion, and, and our, our ladies bring the food. And really, uh, bef beforehand, all you got to do is help with the food and stuff, show up and be a blessing. Just shake people's hands, show them the love of Christ, and, uh, and it's always a good time, and, and it's a blessing. And what you'll find, you go out there to be a blessing, but some of those folks are going to be a blessing to you. And if you need a blessing, I would encourage you to do that. So remember, that's coming up uh, on uh, the 29th. And then November the 7th is Daylight Savings Time, so you, you fall back in the fall, so remember that, and so that's coming up really, really soon, so I believe that's it as far as the announcements are concerned, we got the people having surgery, we got everything in the bulletin, is that it? Well, so good to see you this morning, let's stand, we'll be dismissed in prayer, and uh, next week uh, we'll, we'll continue to work through this uh, sermon, God had a little bit different plan than uh, original, originally thought, so 
we've got two more points to cover. So next week, the week after, whenever it's done, it's done. But the important thing is, is that we get the word that God has for each of us. Not what pastor said, but what God said through his word. Amen. And to him be glory. And so it's so good to have uh, my nephew and niece and their family here this morning. Love them very dearly. Uh, doing, a, doing a great job. And, and I tell you, uh, uh, they were such a blessing. Uh, Cody was a real big blessing with all that, with dad out at the base and everything, and his dad as well, Brother Robert Allen. And I love you guys. Thank you all for being here this morning. I, I like the mustache. It looks good. I thought, I didn't know who you were at first, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, it, it's so good to be here this morning. So uh, remember to pray for one another, love one another, lift up each other in prayer. And I'm going to ask Brother Rick Motley if he'll word our dismissal. God bless you. We'll see you this Wednesday night at 7. Uh, we, we finished up joy. So love, joy, peace. That's what's coming. All right, we'll see you all then.